another quarterfinal match about to get underway. So let's go ahead and meet our players. Our first, hailing from Taiwan, one of the best players from his region. Please welcome to stage Tom60229. In his second world championship appearance, Tom is hoping to do one better than last time. His opponent, the final rookie remaining here, please welcome to the stage Samuel Tao. Samuel Tsao shocked the world in the Bahamas when he qualified for the World Championship. Do you have more surprises left for us? Quarterfinal number two, Samuel Tsao versus Tom60229. I spend a tremendous amount of time on Hearthstone, playing on ladder and other tournaments. It's a huge time commitment trying to improve my ranking. When Tom and I practice together, he gives me a lot of insights into the game. What has helped me the most are the tournaments I have played recently. I have matured a lot and gained much experience, which is why I am here now. I've learned a lot from Tom. He has given me a lot of advice and helped make me a better player. Samuel Tsao versus Tom60229. Let's see what you got. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Hearthstone 2017 World Championship. Second quarterfinal of the day. About to get underway between, you know, this is sort of an age-old story, Admiral. The, te the teacher versus the student. Oh, yeah. Uh, Tom and Sam connected after Bahamas. Uh, Tom, in, during the interview, said he actually didn't know who Samuel Tsao was. Yeah. Uh, both of them being from Taiwan, obviously he makes some pretty good practice partners, if that's the case. He, he mentioned that he thought that Samuel Tsao's aggressive play was exceptional and that he wanted to practice with him to learn more about that. Yeah, and uh, uh, Tom was the one who approached Samuel Tsao to, to practice with him, uh, which is a, a pretty big you know, gesture when you consider it. And Samuel Tsao mentioned that he, he, he felt you know, really good about the fact that Tom was the one to reach out to him. But taking a look at the lineups, uh, slight differences here. As we've seen throughout the entire tournament, Samuel Sal being on Agro Druid, Tom60229 being on the J Druid. And J Druid has had, uh, I feel like, a lot more success. Almost all of the players with J Druid had qualified for the for the quarterfinals that brought in their lineup. Yeah, I think one of the big things that we've been seeing is that Oaken Summons is proving uh, a lot of worth in the J Druid package. You know, how much do you really need Jade Spirit if you can make up that advantage? In other ways, you think about some of your matchups uh, against priests. You're trying to win via the armor count. Uh, against the aggro decks, you're trying to win simply by stopping their push. The Jade Spirit doesn't really do those things, and the Oaken Summons provides you two waves of defense. Oftentimes, uh, the, the fact that the Jade Druids have come prepared with that specific package, I think, has been a big benefit to them this weekend. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we're going to start off with the matchup right away. It's going to be Aggro Druid versus Jade Druid to start things off. And uh, Tom's got a uh, one key card in that opening hand that has aggro druids all across the world sweating. And What's that's that? Spreading Plague. Oh, I thought it was the Arcane Tyrant. Yeah, so Ar Arcane Tyrant 2. Um, that, that is definitely uh, somewhat of a problem more for Samuel Tsao's deck, I'd say, than it would be for some of the other aggro druids that we've seen. Uh, Samuel Tsao's tops out uh, with Living Mana, Cobalt Scalebane, and Corridor Creeper. Uh, top out with Corridor Creeper. Yeah. Um, Only one Scalebane as well. No Bitter Tide Hydra. That's right. And that's been a, a big performer, I think, versus... Uh, uh, Jade Druid throughout the weekend is just such a large threat that it constantly has pressure on the Jade Druid player to to mount a defense and then also be able to kill it afterwards. Now, while we've seen that happen, it's quite unusual that's the case. But he also has one of the more important starts here with an opening in Enchanted Raven and the buff with the card draw right afterwards. That's a lot of pressure on Tom Early. That's right. But we've seen time and time again these uh, Aggro Druids having blistering starts. But if they can't make a couple of big threats that they just keep buffing up and they are forced to go wide on the board at some point. What? Spreading Plague has been a massive punish for these types of strategies uh, throughout the entire weekend here at the World Championship. And Tom Nolan over his turn. Yeah. It feels like something's up here. Like You can tell he's already working on sequencing out these turns. In case Samuel Zhao has one of those blistering starts, how does he want to react if that's the case? Um, that's a lot of planning that goes into a hand like this when you have Spreading Plague, you have a couple of removal spells, and you have a Jade Behemoth. You need to figure out at what points do those inflections really hit, and you have to take advantage of them. That time window is going to close because Sam Sal has much pressure as well. So Tom, he's got to get going about as quickly as possible here. 
Yeah, but it does have Jade Blossom. That's going to be a little bit of ramp, but we're still a few turns away from spreading plague. And Samuel Sal actually picks up Saucy Captain. So unless Patches is the very next draw, he's going to have a, a pretty powerful turn. And this is this is one of the panouts I think that actually really benefits Tom. And one of the reasons why I think Samuel Sal might not find the easiest win in this matchup is that even though he's got this much pressure, his his top end right now is Living Mana. So into a card like Spreading Plague, that card is quite ineffective. Uh, Tom having Swipe and having Wrath looks like he is going to get through this early push, mm -hmm. and it's a matter of how Sam can attack afterwards. So th this is quite a, a concerning situation if you're Samuel Sal. Also, sort of the order of things, Galaka Crawler has been a Tekken aggro druid because players were expecting a lot of aggressive mirrors. Tempo Rogue uh, was a deck that almost everybody uh, brought to the tournament, so and almost everybody so expected everybody else to bring to the tournament. That coupled with aggro druid being a popular choice uh, made Galaka Crawler uh, a, a good inclusion for Aggro Druid. Also coupled with the fact that, you know, it's got the B synergy with Mark of Yasharaj, that it's just an early curve minion that synergizes a lot with the deck. Uh, but if you play your pirates before you get the Glocker Crawler and your opponent's not playing any pirates in their deck, you can get into these awkward situations where you can't play your Glocker Crawler because your, your pirates are on your board. Yeah. And, and this this is one of the reasons why you see Sam Sal trade with the Enchanted Raven rather than uh, that Patches instead. Swipe would have just been an abysmal turn for him if he chose to trade with Patches and yep. uh, keep a 2-1 around and then the 4-4 four, four around. Uh, those little things matter a lot, and he's also expecting uh, Oaken Summons quite often. Now, Tom drew that fresh off the top, but now suddenly Savage Roar is prepared to fight through this and continue pushing that little bit of damage. Yeah, and Savage Roar, we've talked about it a couple times over the past couple matchups that we've cast, but getting the value early with Savage Roar can oftentimes be a good boon uh, for the Aggro Druid player because they may not have an opportunity to get good value out of it later on. Yeah. Um, it, uh, maybe it can help you get over Spreading Plague, but a lot of times Spreading Plague comes after Living Mana and you don't have an opportunity to even cast it because you don't have the mana for it, Right. Uh, the, the turn post-Living Mana. So he didn't really have any other options here. But even if he did, Savatoro would be an enticing option. And ex excuse my trade of the 4-3. Of the, uh, he obviously will be using his health total in that spot. His, yeah. his life total is largely irrelevant for the large portion of this game. By the time Tom starts delivering damage, it's likely he's locked up the game at that state, at that spot anyway. Um, but this turn from Tom is really going to be an important one here. Uh, it really boils down to how much he removes from board, and then if Sam Sal has a big follow-up. The fact that he's missing again, Bitter Tide Hydra, is such an important measure. Almost any way you slice this, Tom lands a good spreading plague. Now, I, I want to talk a minute about Samuel Sal's next turn. He's got double living mana in hand, but that will be going right into turn six for Tom. He saw a card kept on the mulligan. That card has not been played yet. What choices? Do you ever just not living mana? Well, the, the problem then is that is that what happens for Tom's range that Samuel Sal loses to it that yeah. spot. And, and those are really big questions. Uh, maybe Sam Sal looks at it and goes, if his only defense is Spreading Plague, maybe I can get him to absorb just a little bit and then Living Mana afterwards to push. Yeah. So that is likely something that he's going to think about and is very oh, dependent on his draw. Away. But if he doesn't play Living Mana, then the Jade Behemoths can start punishing yeah. Tom. I'm sorry, Sam as well. So that's sort of uh, the point of, you know, sometimes you just have to take the risk and hope they don't have it yeah. when you're playing aggressive decks. And that's a good lesson. Uh, when you are, uh, you know, even online playing aggressive decks, sometimes the the right play to make is just to make your strongest play each turn and force your opponent to have the answers. Now, Cobalt Scalebane. That changes things. That, that will change Sam's play. That is that is the minion in his deck that's designed to fight against Spreading Plague in an efficient manner. And you can see his posture change uh, right when he draws that card. Like, oh my gosh, I thought I was going to have to take a huge risk, yeah. and now I don't. Yeah, it's also a card that's been good for inclusions mm -hmm. against Highlander Priest uh, because it doesn't uh, get killed by Dragonfire Potion uh, because that Dragon Tag. And I think this is an easy trade here for yeah. Sam Sal. Not necessarily easy. Uh, I think it is quite a painful trade to have to make, but you would much rather keep as much health in your scale bane as possible Ooh. than set yourself up. And that is a, a quite a poor result, I think, overall, because now Tom is the option for swiping and clearing off the scale bane. But I don't really know if he has the life to afford that right now. Or maybe he does. That was a pretty quick decision from Tom. Well, he might have a good read on what those cards are in the far left. Uh, and that could, that could be part of the case, too. You know, what would Sam Sal have not played by this point? Um, that could still be there. Yeah, I'm thinking like Mark of the Lotus, maybe Power of the Wild. There's no opportunities to use those two particular cards. Sam Sal, once again, faced with the decision how to load up. Uh, at this stage, 
Jade Behemoth, Malfurion, those start becoming quite scary cards. But since he's stuck to his uh, guns on the Cobalt Scalebane, he might just follow up with the Captain here as well. Uh, the, the thing that I'm fearing is he still doesn't really have a strong way to figure out whether or not Tom has Spreading Plague or not. The Cobalt Scalebane was his decided play. You know, yeah. That's when he built his deck, he decided to do that if on he, turn five. If he just plays South Sea Captain, hmm. Tom wouldn't pull the trigger on Spreading Plague in almost any scenario. So it's not a, it's not a check for it. Right. And uh, he doesn't have a way to sequence that Glock Crawler, and that's exactly what yeah. he comes to the conclusion that he just got to hope he doesn't have it. He can't make a weak play again. Oh, wow. Tom, Tom to do a it. second swipe as well. Yeah. And that's a big deal if, yeah. if Sam Sal doesn't draw a buff in this spot. That means his entire board game. Yeah, because most of the time, Sam is going to attack in with these living mana tokens and put him at one health and just make it easy. It's like this animation is just like taunting him every single time, too. It's like... One by one. <gasps> That's a pretty darn good draw, though. Now the fact that Sam Salas has the second living mana and power of the wild to go with it, you know, suddenly that changes a lot of this game dynamic as well. It's not, it's not as easy as Tom just sitting behind the board and setting this up. The, th the thing about it is it's hard for Sam to trade off the board in a really efficient manner. So if this goes at a stalemate, what ends up happening is Tom just chips away at Sam's total until he gets to a dangerous spot. Yeah, uh, Sam, Sam needs multiple turns to be able to set up living mana into a buff. Yeah. I like Power of the Wild because next turn he's not doing anything. That's going to give Tom a lot of time to put something together. Yeah. Now he is only at 10, so you know that is quite a dangerous life total. So if I'm in Tom's spot here, it looks to me like you trade off a portion of the board and, and maybe go with Jade Behemoth to start uh, accelerating that that clock on, on Sam Hill's out. His hand isn't super secure, so it makes a lot of sense to uh, to maybe sacrifice these scarabs and start pressuring Sam back. Yeah, that's that's the big decision point for Tom. The, this looks like the juiciest swipe of his life, <laughs> but is it really? Is it better to actually Build up a minion. Start that Jade counter going. Get an expensive card like Jade Behemoth out of your hand. It's even better clean to start up the board. chipping away his life total now and just force Sam to, to make a, to play Power of the Wild, maybe, or Mark the Lotus on a board that's already been partially weakened. That, that's, yeah. That's kind of a risk because at this point he's had two draws since the last time he would have played a buff. I like, like this play for Tom, yeah. Because yeah. the thing about it is now if he's in Power of the Wild, he's still stunting Samuel Sal's development because all of his mana is tied up in those living mana tokens. So if Sam uses Power of the Wild here and starts running back over these Scarabs, then Tom gets to use Swipe as a tempo play to, to really deliver that clock yeah. back to Samuel Sal. I think this is a brilliant uh, move from Tom. I think a lot of players swipe in that scenario. I would have untapped and swiped and said go. In about two and a half seconds. I probably would have lost. Because we look at the scenario, what it would have been like if he did swipe, he would have had no development besides maybe a Jade Idol. Samuel Sal would have played a fresh Living Mana with more tokens. And then potentially followed that up with Power of the Wild. And the board wouldn't have been as strong as it was now. And Tom would be down a swipe, so he wouldn't have that to clean up the board afterwards. And the thing about it is, from Sam's perspective, it really looks like Tom doesn't have that second swipe. Uh, that, that is a check for swipe in a lot of scenarios. And so the fact that Tom has made this brilliant move, it means that Sam is going to keep trading into these tokens, weakening up the board a little bit further, and give Tom that opening to, to press back. So Tom might be doing the math here of swipe a minion versus swipe the face. Yeah. Uh, if he swipes face, he pushes 12 damage. If he goes all face with that, he develops arcane oh, tower. Yeah. Well, Tom's all in, and I think this is a very winning scenario for him. There is no way really for Sam Sal to push back through this. And that's 10 represented on board with nothing that affects the board state in Sam's hand. That's basically a checkmate scenario. Or in his deck. Except for that. That is the only card that can provide any defensive measure. But even then, any type of armor gain or damage draw at that stage would be able to allow him to push through because Samuel Sal would have to drew the swarm for taunt 
and he would also have to hero power. They're bringing up to 11 with five with uh, five health worth of taunts on the board. Tom just straight up has 12. So he would need an armor upgrade plus a hero power that would allow him to push through with the Jasper Spellstone. We Tom's got a lot of draws in that deck. Ultimate Infestation would allow him to push through because he'll be on 10 mana next turn. So we're looking at branching paths. We're looking at Oaken Summons. We're looking at second lesser Jasper spell. So we're looking at Ultimate Infestation. All these cards just end the game I next turn. No one. Uh, there's and also a lot of cards that. that like effectively end the game as yeah. well, like giant defensive measures. Yeah. Uh, in the same vein, pretty much do the job. You know, Oaken Summons upgrades the Spellstone uh, to four. It's, there's so much that Sam Zhao has to have go right at the stage. But that is quite an awkward draw. Yeah, now if he draws into Oaken Summons, it's not enough. Uh, branching Paths would still be enough. No, 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 Oaken Summons would still be enough. Uh, he would Lesser Jasper Spellstone attack and it. Yeah, you're right. One, yeah. uh, because of the... I believe but He doesn't the... get it. In fact, wow. he doesn't really draw anything of much value here. And now Tom's got to worry about uh, offensive pressure from Samuel Sal. And that's what I wanted to talk about before Tom had cast that Nourish, is what happens if he fails the draw? You mean, would it better be have just played Jade Behemoth and played it safe that turn? It's, I'm not sure. I, I don't really know. I mean, he does get to break through here, so if he has enough to fend off against, say, Savage Roar yeah. or, and Mark of the Lotus here, the ultimate infestation will end the game, but Tom has to now do a bunch of math on where does he lose? He's got to clear off these tokens because of the threat of Savage, or he can no longer go with that aggressive game plan. Samuel Sao would have plenty of mana in order to do that. I think that's finally locked it up. Sam yeah. is no offensive pressure left. Yeah, even though a Savage Roar draw would have not allowed him to push through, and that means Tom takes game number one in this quarterfinal. Again, Jay Druid having a lot of success here at the World Championship. It, it's, again, the Oaken Summons. Tom drew it right on turn four after yeah. an aggressive mulligan, and that card was a major impact to him winning that game. I do believe that before Tom nourished, he had thought about that turn and thought, I have enough to clear off the board, but just wanted to take his time and figure out the best way to fight back against it. So yeah, uh, I, I believe Tom had that calculated and tight play from him so far. Yeah, that's right. Sammy Sal on the back foot now. Uh, but also another thing we want to uh, highlight to you guys is there's actually um, a line building up to uh, have uh, stuff signed by me and Admirable. <laughs> uh, but for now, the lesser casters of Frodan and Kibler are standing in for us. <laughs> so thanks, everybody. We'll be over there in a few moments once this match is done. And thanks, Kibler and Dan, for filling in for us. But for now, we'll see if Samuel Sal can bring it back in the next game right after this.原本我只是單純很喜歡魔獸跟卡牌遊戲而已。當初完全沒有想過自己會成為爐石的職業選手。直到在ONOG擊敗Colento後,才了解我其實很強。然後這一路上我拿到了台灣第一甚至是亞太第一不過這些頭鞋跟講座都沒什麼實際的感覺畢竟比賽不是你期望怎樣就會怎樣的唯一能做好的只有挑試好每一次上場的心態這次我幾
从前只是个炉石玩家，到代表国家出征的选手。我经过无数的挫折，不断的调整、修正，再出发。才有今天的我。我是神喵草，准备好迎接这次的胜利。或许有一天，你也能站上世界舞台。I'm Samuel Sao. I'm coming from Chinese Taipei. When I'm not studying, I'll play Hearthstone all day long. But on school days, studying is my first priority. My favorite food is a bowl of traditional Taiwanese beef noodles. I'm a Christian, so I always pray before tournaments. It brings me peace. Welcome back, everybody, to the Hearthstone World Championship. We're about to jump into game number two of Samuel Sal versus Tom 60229. 60,229 enemies vanquished. Is Samuel Sal the next one? He's going to change the whole name after that. <laughs> if only. But now we're going to get into uh, another mirror. Well, sort of a mirror, class mirror with priest versus priest. Well, you, you say class mirror, but it, it's it's pretty much a mirror match. There, there's very little difference between these two lists. One of the major ones to look at is that Tom has come a little extra prepared for uh, this particular matchup. Uh, Warlock has been a big ban of most players in the tournament. In fact, of the top eight players remaining, I believe there's only been two non-Warlock bans. Um, and that trend stays true to this match. Tom has a copy of Lyra the Sun Shard and Gadgets and Auctioneer. Yeah, in his deck, where Samuel Sal only has uh, a copy of Lyra. And if you remember back to the Summer Championships, that was really the first appearance of Gatsin Auctioneer in the tournament uh, Highlander Priest list. That extra card draw that you get can really fuel you to a Raza Anduin draw very quickly. However, Tom already has Raza and Anduin, so uh, a very different battle that, that Samuel Sal is going to have to fight in this game. Yeah, and the difference being, you know, Gatsin Auctioneer is there for matchups where you want to just draw through your deck as quickly as possible. When your opponent has a finite amount of health, where there's no real X factor, you're just trying to kill him from 30 as quickly as possible. Uh, Lyra's there when you're playing those matchups where you need a little bit of extra oomph. You need a couple cards that aren't in your deck. And we're talking about those matchups where uh, your opponents may be able to gain uh, some additional health, say Jade Druid or Big Mage. Um, Lyra also uh, has the added benefit of sometimes just, you know, catching your opponent off guard and um, giving you that, that extra ability in matchups that you may not have been favored in from the get-go. It's also just a body that comes out earlier. Yeah. Uh, and we've seen it sort of split up until the World Championship, where some players brought just Gadzan Auctioneer, and some players brought just Lyra, depending on their feel and what matchups they, they thought they were going to run into the most. Yeah. The, the one, so, yeah, so Tom basically has just a big advantage because he's got both of those. Well, the one thing that is kind of curious to me is, is Tom's cut for the uh, Gadzan Auctioneer or the Lyra, depending on how you look at it. And it's that he cut Novice Engineer. And Novice Engineer is actually one of, one of the, I'd say, better cards in this deck to end up having just because of its its card draw potential is so important early on. You know, you want to be spending the mana early to draw cards in these styles of matchups, not necessarily later. Um, so that is quite an interesting choice that Tom made, and I'd be curious to to know exactly why that choice is made. I mean, I, you exchange one a two cost draw for a six plus cost draw. 
I don't know about that, Teach. Well, it's multiple draws, theoretically. Most of the time it is. So just playing a little bit greedier for that late game. But I'm liking the way Tom's hand looks right now. I mean, I mean anytime you have Raza and Chattery Brand in your hand, especially in the mirror, you're feeling pretty good. Yeah, especially if you have ways to, to fight off a little bit of early pressure. Uh, it, that does matter sometimes in this matchup where you just get minions on board and start chipping away life total. Sometimes it can boil down to a race uh, of that damage. You're not always putting together this giant amount of combo damage and killing your opponent for 30. Sometimes you both end up throwing your resources into the fray trying to fight for that board position and it ends up being uh, just two damage after two damage over and over again. Sometimes you kill them, you know, 15, 18 life or whatever. Wow, oh my gosh. Tom is just, I, this is a, a, one of the best draws imaginable for, for this matchup, I imagine, I think. This is the Highlander Priest starting kit. Sam Sal is facing that awkward pressure right now where he doesn't have an effective way to really fight back against his board. Lyra's going to get almost no value in this circumstance. He can play Ooh. Circle of Healing to just get one card off Lyra and force some attention to it, but it would get eaten up pretty easily by just the hero power and the uh, Arcanine Soul Priest hit. And so he's just going to go ahead, heal his face, and pass. And... That, I, I, he's only missing Mind Blast at this point. I, everything's there. Maybe Holy Smite to complete the, the Radiant the Elemental package. And you notice that Samesau didn't play the Accolade of Pain. He's trying to fend off against Potion of Madness being a, a big liability to him, but I'm not sure he's actually at liberty of, of making those styles of plays this game. It's just under so much pressure here. So maybe he gets the benefit of knowing that he has his Dragonfire Potion on this turn yeah. and follows up with Acolyte and like Spirit Lash in a certain way. But I would have, I think I would have liked to see him play that Acolyte of Pain and, and just try to get a draw. Maybe even just soak up a hit from the Arcanine sure. Soul Priest in that spot. Yeah. This really is a race to assemble uh, the Raza and Anduin combo in, in a lot of situations, even if you are fighting for more in the meantime. Yeah, it's true, and you do want to protect your life total, but I, maybe he's pretty confident that he'll get multiple draws later. Say he draws Spirit Lash, say he draws Wild Pyromancer. Those are cards where you can immediately get uh, value out of uh, Acolyte of Pain without having to worry about Potion of Madness too much. Yeah, so. it's a true story. But right now, I mean, <laughs> Tom's probably going to jam Kazakus next turn, fish for a good one-mana potion that has damage attached to it. Well, I, I think that, that could depend here as well. I mean, Dragonfire Go does give Tom the option of looking for, say, like a, biz, a big Resurrect Potion in this spot. Maybe he favors the five. It's just with, with his hand being this good, I do believe he'll go for one. Yeah. I mean, that, that Maybe there's one... even merits like Auctioneer Coin Power Word Shield at this stage. Yeah, but, but you know, that one mana potion, if you get three damage, it effectively becomes mm. ten damage well, later a... on in the game with, with uh, the Velen. This is a big question, though. I mean, how would Sam Sal fight off a 4 6 Gagsden Auctioneer in this spot? He, he would have to Psychic Scream, basically, or just use a silence, a natural silence. And I think that's what's going through Tom's mind, but. Coin is uh, so valuable. Yeah, Coin is very valuable. It's four damage later on with Velen. And it allows Ooh. you to open up that mana slot for the one mana potion. I don't think there's any way you slice it. That potion is pretty darn weak for Tom at the end of the day. Summon a friendly minion and add a random demon to your hand. Now, there's a lot of cheap demons. Fuel for the fire. That's right. Tom just sort of picking the only options that really have an effect in this matchup. <laughs> His other options were freeze a minion to damage the board. Yeah. I don't even know what you do in this scenario. Well, I mean, if I'm in the same seat, I'm feeling quite desperate. So yeah. I, I do like the Spirit Lash in this instance. And I think there is some consideration just holy smiting your own uh, Acolyte of Pain and seeing if you, if you can pick up the right draws. Yeah. Spot. He's just got a power cycle. Looking for Raza, looking for card draw, looking for Kazakus. That's about it. I guess Curious Glimmerroot could, you know, find uh, one of those pieces. Well, Tom is, he's really wanting to play this auctioneer. I got the best deals anyway. And rightfully so. I mean, this is a lot of gas that he's going to get.
I mean, he's at risk of overdrawing with the loot border, but at this point, he doesn't even care. <laughs> and we got everything he needs already, basically, except that's, for maybe the Mind Blast. And that's the thing. When you risk the overdraw here and your opponent sees that, you're just going, oh, no. I guess they have it. Like, why, would, why else would Tom risk this unless mm -hmm. it's just a blunder? At that point, Samuel Sal probably isn't even worried about that. He's worried about his own game plan, so he pro he's probably just going to even push the Madness this loot hoarder to take the draw for himself. I think he'd rather have the draw than go for an overdraw here. Is there ever a merit to going for Fire plus Radiant Elemental and then Potion the Madness and try and keep that chain of spells going? I mean, he's got he's got Mind Blast. He's got into it. If he finds Raza, the Radiant Elemental and Mind Blast could be key for him in this game. And staring down the Auctioneer with Tom having, uh, you know, nine cards in hand, going ten cards, maybe there is some merit to not Psychic Extreme, but that is terrifying. It's not a very good Psychic Extreme. I mean, you just put a Kazakus back in Tom's deck. The light has betrayed me. Sam knows this is the beginning of the end for him because he does not have his own Anduin active. He doesn't have Raza active. This is as bad as it gets, I think. This is, this is quite bad. For him to even have a hope, this would have to be almost exactly Raza, or the next draw would have to be almost exactly Raza. Uh, now, what if he Glimmer Roots Raza? That, that looks like the direction to go right now. In that case, I, I think if that's your hope, you want to Shattery Brain to it first. So that way you stick a board afterwards. Ah. Getting it out of the way and then hoping that either your next draw is Raza or Curious Glimmer Root gets Raza. Well, hold on. Tom is uh, about to put on a show here. Looks like 18 to me. 18 max. If you're Samuel Sal. Yep. Is Tom playing Pit Lord? No, that, that can't be right. He I, played Pit I Lord. Don't that. He does not need armor anymore. There's no Raza on board. You might as well just make a 5 6. But we can now say that Pit Lord was played in the quarterfinals of the World <laughs> Championship. In Priest, mind you. And yeah, it looks like it's just too late for Samuel Sal, unless he picks up healing Shattered from Lyra. Thoughts. That's the only way he can survive, even just past this turn. And then he, would ha he has to worry about the board and clear that, but he's got to go for Lyra plus Radiant Elemental and hope for a miracle. Chain of Smites. A Chain of Smites and then a Chain of Binding Heals afterwards. Yeah, just 15 Smites in a row. <laughs> okay. Or a mixture of the two. It's only like trillions to one, probably. If that. All right, looking for a Holy Smite. Didn't get it. Looking for a Holy Smite. Oh, this could... Oh, almost. Not going to be enough. Lee, that's it. Tom has plenty of damage. So much. Not all. Tom's going to take uh, a pretty quick 2-0 lead here over Sam Sal. And uh, that hand was just gas. Sometimes you got the goods and you're just not beating it. Raza Priest, time and time again, players considered to be one of the strongest decks in the game. But when they get pitted up against each other, Sometimes the stars align for one player and they don't for the other. Samuel Sao is now one game away from elimination. I feel like Tom has gotten wins on two very important decks to get win on. I, I think Jade Druid can struggle versus Sam Sao's lineup. I think the Highlander Priest is a bit more greedy against the aggressive lineup from Sam. Tempo Rogue is what's left. And Tom has shown some pretty impressive play on Tempo Rogue. So we're going to see if he can close it out and complete the sweep in game number three right after this. Don't stray too far away from the fire. There's more tales to tell at the World Championship.
So, and how does a car like get designed or gets into Hearthstone? Because we all know the Warcraft uh, background all and the lore has been in it. But doesn't it does it first? Uh, is the design coming first, or is the card itself like in Hearthstone the first part? Uh, we we call those two directions top down and bottom up. So sometimes uh, okay. we have a great design for a card, right? Like we mm -hmm. like uh, uh, Reno Jackson, I think is a good example, right? He's a card that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we knew we wanted to encourage people to do decks that were one of, one of each card type, right? So that was the design was first, and we it eventually ended up on Reno Jackson. And sometimes we have a, a, a fantasy that we're chasing. A, a, like, Jaraxxus is a great example of that, right? We, mm -hmm. uh, we were doing a play test, and uh, when we were doing this play test, this is a long time ago, we had Horde and Alliance versions of every class. Okay. So uh, I think for Warlock, it was Cho'Gall and... Uh, Wilfred Fizzlebang were the two heroes. Mm -hmm. And so we brought a guy in from the World of Warcraft team to test the Hearthstone and, and see what he thought about the game. And he chose Wilfred Fizzlebang. And he said, oh, I hope there's a Jaraxxus card in this deck. Mm -hmm. Because famously, uh, Wilfred Fizzlebang in the, the World of Warcraft raid summit, tries to summon a Doom Guard, ends up summoning Jaraxxus instead. Jaraxxus kills him and takes over as the new boss. And he's like, all right, well, you gotta face me now. Uh, and so there wasn't a Jaraxxus card. Mm -hmm. Shoot, Every, of course everyone's gonna say that. We must have a Jaraxxus card. And I went back to my desk and I d designed Jaraxxus. That's a top-down design where we start with the fantasy and they come up with mechanics that fit the fantasy. But we do a lot of both, actually. We do uh, a significant amount of designs that are based on the theme of the expansion. So uh, a good example is the Grand Tournament. We wanted some, what, what is a, a refreshment vendor, right? Like that's gonna be at a tournament. What would he do at a tournament? He might give people funnel cakes and heal them or something, right? And then, mm -hmm. and then we also wanted designs that were uh, reminiscent of the, the hero power fantasy of uh, making hero powers matter in that set, and those are more bottom-up designs. World Championship. You can see on your screen now some of the fun that's been happening all across the tavern. And this is what these players are fighting for. The chance to become a world champion and put cards on their heads. <laughs> there's a lot happening around the tavern. There's, uh, there's small little tournaments that are happening alongside these side games. Uh, you can win prizes with exclusive uh, HCT gear. Uh, and I believe that does conclude today as well. Uh, but really fun uh, environment here at the yeah, World Championship. Definitely. But all that fun going on, but probably stressful for these guys on stage. They might be having a little bit of fun, but their eyes are set on the prize. Tom currently has a 2-0 lead against Samuel Sow. The winner of this match moves on to the semifinals. And the loser goes home disappointed. Now, mind you, top eight finish. Doc Poe was just up two games to zero. And you heard Kibler say it. They walked over to the analyst desk. They thought he had it locked up. And things turned around. Jason Joe won that series three games to two. Don't count Samuel Sow out yet because aggressive decks can put together some pretty crazy starts and things can change awfully quick. And what deck was it that Doc Pone got reverse swept with? It was Tempo Rogue. Tom 60229, that's his last remaining deck to find a win with if he wants a spot there. But Samuel Sow's first challenge is going to be with the Aggro Druid. And his opening start. Reasonable outside the Savage Roar. Does need some minions to couple with those buffs. This, 
I mean, that's what the whole deck is, though. It's yeah. buffs and minions. Yeah, this one's a little bit different. Unlike J. Drew that we talked about earlier, where having a few minions that you continuously buff and go tall on the board is not really as good of a strategy against Temple Rogue because they have good single target removal with Vile Spine Slayer, Backstab SI, things like that. It's about going wide on the board and making too many threats for the Temple Rogue to be able to deal with. I'm going to go with the Swash Burglar right away and try to soften up Sam Sal's board. Uh, it, it's quite wise, I think, to be doing that for the most part. And this is becoming an interesting situation for Samuel Tao, which, where having this many buffs, uh, drawing the Fireflies are some of the better draws in the deck. It allows him to use the first one fairly liberally, if you'd like. And the second one, the, the timing of that pressure can be a lot for Tom to handle all at once. Uh, Temple Rogue does a decent job at fighting for board, but not against a lot of things all at once. Uh, most of its time, it's, it wants to backstab an SI7 agent or uh, you know, play Sarnet Chain Gang, soften up the board for combat on the backside, even just coin Vile Spine Slayer. It's when there's a lot of threats presented all at once that it really struggles. What? And so yeah. that's really Sam Sal's job right now, how to partition these resources to maximize his edge versus Tom's next turn or two. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because just a Firefly plus a hero power is actually a play that I would consider, despite having this much stuff in my hand. Now, he does have buffs on the backside, but like you mentioned, maybe it's better to try and save these things and then make buff them up in one turn. But the risk of that is that if Tom has a board to follow it up, then all of a sudden he, he falls behind. He has to, you know, sort of make a, a tough read that Tom doesn't have reload to make that play. So he actually just does go with the Firefly, but Tom's got a way to clear up almost the whole board here. Decides to go with just the Power of the Wild for the, uh, the Panther token. So this is where uh, the first big turn I think Sam Sal comes in. That draw changes a lot of that dynamic. That yep. is quite a powerful draw right now. Um, I'm going to be curious to see if Sam goes with two minions here or if he wants to play the 1-5 uh, the taunt mode uh, and then just buff up the board from there, looking to use the second buff immediately afterwards. Because if you look at his next uh, two or three turns, it would be plus one, plus one on the entire board. So two six taunt, two two threes. Next turn, he buffs those again. And the next turn, he savage roars. So Tom would have to have quite a bit to fight that off. Yeah. Samuel Sal assuming the uh, thinking position. There it is. Hands off the keyboard. You can't play fast then. And that's, that's been a big uh, a talking point, I think, for Samuel Sal. I, I have been quite a fan of his uh, mechanical play in a lot of spots. He's been very patient, and you can see where his thinking is on these turns. Even when things seem quite obvious, he yeah. wants to take his time and dig very deep to see if he can find an alternative. Yeah, he, he does take his time and play quite slowly with these faster decks. And we think back to Winter, where Samuel Sal qualified. Back then, it was best of seven. And he had some, you know, three, four hour long best of seven matches when it was a control meta. But uh, I saw your face kind of light up with that trade. I, I don't like that trade really one bit at all. I think that if Sam Sal makes that trade there, uh, it's what is the main thing he's playing around? Like a, like a Salsi Deccan SI7 agent or Salsi Deccan plus a, uh, a dagger up? I think in that position, he gets some extra damage. And also, it ends up in a very similar situation. Uh, the fact that he's traded that off there, I'm curious what it really means in the long term. Maybe he's done the math on how the next three or four turns pan out, and that two damage just isn't relevant. Now he's kind of uh, in on that boat of buff up his stuff and then hope Savage Roar gets there. But by trading off a minion, that makes it weaker. And instead of forcing Tom to have it, he now puts him put, put himself in a position where he played safe and potentially a little bit too safe. And now I'm curious, does he buff up his minions or does he make a 3-2 token well, with uh, Savage War being in hand? This, this really is the interesting play to me. Uh, I think there is some argument for the Savage War right now. Okay. I'm about to control oh, no, no. his thought process to protect his 2-6 okay. as long as possible. If he plays the Power of the Wild right away, there's just never a world where Tom plays Sarnak Chain Gang. And, and that's actually, I think, one of the better minions that Sam South can see played against him right now. That just plays directly into his power of the wild oh, in that case. Oh, that's exactly what he does. A great swap by Samuel Sal. All right, now that's... I'm playing Malaka. That's tough. I mean, if you play it now, it is a 3-4. You're taking... The first four turns of the game is really, I think, where you can justify fighting for board with Aggro Druid. And he's done that. He's won. So I think you add this 3-4 pressure to it, you put Tom on a clock, and say, if you got it, you got me. Or 
you sacrifice this one two in order to play Power of the Wild, kill over his two minions, and then get Corridor Creeper online. One, two, two. It's a bold call, Teach. Or, no, there's no other or. <laughs> that, that, those are really the two things for him to think about in yeah. this spot. And there's no reason not to take his time at this point. He needs to be picture perfect to, yeah. to make this a real comeback. Corridor Creeper, well, it's going to get cheaper as the game goes on. And it holds on to the Galaka. Tom's just really not have a way to, to fight back against this. Yeah, not a great draw with Shadow Step. There's nothing that he can really do. And that, he's getting punished for having Cobalt Scalebane in his yeah. deck. Uh, you know, Tom has, has trimmed a lot of the defensive measures out of his deck. There are no copies of Tar Creeper. There's one copy of Elven Minstrel, and there's two copies of Cobalt Scalebane. And another Power of the Wild drawn. Wow. Corridor Creeper plus Power of the Wild. He could push 11. This is Damage really this turn. Put Tom at 6. This is really the turn where he's got to think about how his game plan looks versus... Vile Spine Slayer. And with another Power of the Wild, it looks quite strong. Cobalt Scalemane doesn't punch through uh, his Taunt minion. Yeah. And he's pushing 12, 11 damage this turn. I mean, that sets Tom up for lethal. So even through uh, a Vile Spine Slayer this turn, Samuel Sal looks like that he's got the pressure to end this. Yeah. And that's got to be what he's thinking about here, making sure he does the math and understanding that this is going to be the best chance for him to win. Goes in, puts Tom down to just six health. Even Valspine Slayer doesn't save him. Is there a world where he needs to find something from Swashburglar? What can he even find? I can't think of it. I do believe that's where he pretty much has to go with this. <laughs> Branching paths. It's not there. Swipe's not enough. I can almost see the numbers going on in Tom's head. Well, let's go again. <laughs> Fate spinner. It's a 5 3. Can't backstab it. <laughs> no, can't backstab it. the board. <laughs> that would be a pretty oh, sick play. If it dealt six damage to <laughs> If it dealt six damage to everything, but Tom concedes. Samuel Sal puts himself on the board with a win with Agro Druid. And is this going to be a repeat of quarterfinal one? Well, Sam Sal does have a little bit of tech in his lineup to, uh, to fight off against this style of matchup. He does have Highlander Priest with Galaka Crawler in it. And that reverse sweep has begun. And every single time that inches closer, Tom's going to be more and more nervous about it. Now this one. This one could be getting close, but Samuel Sal still has a big hill to climb. Will he be able to reverse sweep this Tempo Rogue? We'll find out after this. dance contest. Who's got the moves? I feel like Garrosh maybe has some secret like pop and locking kind of stuff going on. I cannot do that. And he'd like he'd immediately get the space, you know, like dance floor clears out, gives him a shot, you know, and we just see what he can drop. Sorry that happened. I don't want to admit to having thought about this one before. It's a tie so far in my mind. The surprise hit is going to be Anduin. I must consider. Just because you expect him to be like the most awkward guy at a party, but I feel like he's been like really practicing in the back room somewhere all this time and he'll just break it out and everybody would be, would be wondering where it came from. Not quite what was planned. I want to say Anduin, but I, I think that's too easy. I think that uh, maybe someone like Malfurion. A natural mistake. Like he looks like he does Zumba or something. 
you know, he might, <laughs> he might have some moves that we don't know about. My thanks to you. I think Orc Warriors have that MC Hammer thing going down in uh, World of Warcraft, so maybe Garrosh? <laughs> My thanks. The one that comes to mind to me first is Gul'dan. I feel like, you know, I think it's somebody who's kind of been around for a while, sort of seen it all. I, I could see him sort of cutting a rug and being pretty effective. That was a mistake. I think it's Medivh. Medivh, uh, he threw his own 70s party. He's clearly got dance fever. So kind of you to join me. Medivh? because he's got his own set of backup dancers. I mean, he was the alternate mage hero, but you saw in, in Karazhan, he had some of those disco moves going on. So he's already displayed that he is a dancer and he has a little bit of practice there. I always win. I mean, it's the World Championship. It has to be one of the best field of players. Every year it's gotten better, and this has to be the best by far. It's the strongest ever. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, it's scary. It'll be a great show, I think. Yeah, wish it was easier. Welcome back, everybody. You're looking at Frozen and Sintolaw as they approach the stage, getting ready for the third quarterfinal matchup. Frozen said earlier he thinks he has a 10% odds to win that one. So that's going to be coming up next. But we still have some business left here with Tom versus Samuel Sal. Tom still has a 2-1 lead, but it's with Tempo Rogue as his final deck remaining. And we've seen this deck show weaknesses earlier today. It certainly has. Um, and Samuel Sal, practicing with Tom for this event, uh, it's not really much of a surprise that he has an identical list to what Tom has. Uh, but there is one distinct difference that sets out in this matchup. Uh, number one is who has the coin. The coin offers you a lot of tempo mechanisms that you do not have without it. And then number two is what are the cards that really impact the matchup? A lot of times you think to it and you go, well, Kaliseth, obviously a big one, Shadow Step and Kaliseth. That can be game ending. But when it comes down to it, it's the it's the South Sea Captains, it's the SI7 agents, it's the Vile Spine Slayers. Those are the cards that really make the biggest impact in the match. Yeah, we saw in, I believe it was Ant versus Stanu Dachi, um, where uh, Ant was able to get Keliseth coin or Keliseth Shadow Step Keliseth. With Shadow, Shadow Step Keliseth. <laughs> Three Kelisets, if you've been counting, and he still fell to Shen Udachi, who just tempoed him out with those exact cards that you mentioned. So. Yeah. And, you, and you heard it mentioned even uh, this morning when he, when he was speaking with Dan Kibler, he feels like that he didn't play that matchup entirely optimally. He made a misplay with his coin and how different things would have been had he been more patient. Uh, Corridor Creeper is another one of those tempo plays that really impacts things. But Sam Sao did pick up quite an interesting uh, card from the Swash Burglar uh, with Sonya. I've known a lot of players to include this, and I personally like Sonya in the main deck myself, but the fact that it's come off the of Swash Burglar, that is something that Tom cannot really be prepared for. Yeah, it's very true. There's a couple players in this very tournament who include uh, that Muzzy uh, notably has a Sonya in his Tempo Rogue. And so uh, that's just a little bit of extra benefit. But you mentioned the coin, and players are putting counterfeit coin in their list naturally. Notably, uh, a player named Rage hit rank one. Uh, on the America's Ladder just uh, about a week ago with a, a list that had a, a counterfeit coin. So if you have the coin, you're automatically at a favorite in this matchup. 
Sam Sal is determined that he will at least not be trading the uh, Swashburglar here. Uh, Swashburglar, I think, the more beneficial of the two when it comes to things like Shadow Step, the Sonya, and the Scott. And I like the push of the damage here. I think a lot of players would take this trade straight up, but Tom doesn't have a way to take advantage of it. You get your free point of damage and set the initiative on Tom to trade. Every little point here counts. Yeah. And Tom taking it slow, that coin is incredibly valuable. So he wants to make sure that whenever he uses it, it's for the best of reasons. Next turn has the possibility now. of playing Elemental coin Edwin, and then the following turn he could coin Filespine Slayer. So two great opportunities. I'm now officially worried for Samuel Sal because he doesn't have a way to actually take advantage of this Sonya. I, I think he may be forced into playing it here and really trying to operate on a curve. Uh, Sarnak Chain Gang's his only turn four play. He has no other tempo plays lined up. And he's got Cobalt Scalebane, a card that just does not operate that well in this matchup. He has to try to get something going, and Tom is going to punish this very hard. It was Corridor Creeper in hand. Oh. Another Cobalt Scalebane picked up. This is, I think, probably one of the worst pan outs that Sam Sal could have seen. Both scale bands, the Lich King opening hand, no uh, synergy with Shadow Step, and a Bone Mare this early. Oh, the deck's called Tempo Rogue for a reason. It's because you utilize tempo tools early on in the game, and none of these cards are to do are are doing that. They're all sort of the, that those support cards. And that's the thing: is Cobalt Scale Bane's included in this deck because uh, these players anticipated having to ban Warlock so much that they wanted the extra strength against a deck like Highlander Priest. How much does it cost them when they don't get that going? Sam's out not attacking with his dagger last turn means that this, the captain is now protected behind a Saranite Chain Gang. That trade would have been much better for, for Sam Sao had he preemptively attacked with that dagger. He's, he's pretty lined up to use a Cobalt Scalebane in this spot. I mean, maybe the Shadow Step to try to buy time. But look at how much worse that is when that captain lives at one health. Yeah, and because of Samuel Sal's slow start, Tom has not been forced to use any of these tools, which means he's going to be able to, as we talked about earlier, make a lot of stuff in one turn, which is what Rogue struggle with. He's got Quarter Creeper now for free. That's just going to be more fodder to combo with Edwin Van Cleef. And it's desperate when players use Shadow Step on a Saturday Night Chain Gang. How long can it go on? I, d I don't know. I apologize for, for the feed uh, in this instance. We'll try to get this resolved as quickly as we can. Just like that. You're welcome. And th this is Edwin Van Cleef territory. Yep. Tom is pulling way ahead. Yep. Sam Sal, I think, needs to draw exactly Vile Spine Slayer, or he is going to die quickly. And even then, he's got two big threats on the board that he needs to deal with. Bone Mare still stranded. Lich King still a few turns away. Oh. Shadow Step does absolutely nothing in this scenario. The only thing it does is maybe he can Shadow Step the Firefly to make sure that he has a Bone Mare target next turn, but then he'd be doing nothing else and he would be thoroughly dead. I think Sam Sal knows that the end is near. This is, this was a huge turn from Tom. And he will have that guaranteed target for Bone Mare next turn, but that's just, too much. It just seems like too little too late. Board clear. Take 15. Go. Tom knocking at the door of the top four of the 2017 World Championships. His first World Championships was an early exit. He went 0-2 and two in that tournament. And since then, Tom has never given up. He's had a wealth of performances across that career. Well played. And add another one to that, because Tom is moving on to the top four with a three to one victory over Samuel Sal. And gave the stat earlier, there hasn't been a world champion that didn't lose once in the group stage. And so far, the players that have had success are the ones falling first in the quarterfinals as Tom 
becomes our second semifinalist. Both players at 2-1 yeah. have advanced through, and there you can see the camaraderie and the friendship that's developed over the last yeah. year. A lot of respect for each other. Yeah. Practice partners, Tom sort of uh, acting as a mentor, but Samuel Sal, uh, Tom admitted, taught him a lot about how to play those faster decks. And there you can see our first semifinal is set. It will be Jason Joe versus Tom60229, two players that have been to the World Championship before, so I'm looking forward to that one. But for now, let's go ahead and hear from Tom and Tom on the stage. Thank you very much. I'm Tom, joined by Tom. Talk to me about what your feelings are now that you've qualified for the top four of the World Championship. Uh, <laughs> I want to win it all. Oh, all right. He definitely wants to keep moving on, of course. But, um, you know, the thing I want to talk about and highlight is the fact that you and Samuel Tao practice with each other. You're both from Taiwan, and you both kind of consider each other as part of your group that came here to the World Championship. So I want to ask, what were you guys talking about before the match going into the, semi or going to the quarterfinals? Mm. <laughs> So one thing that's worth noting is that when uh, he practiced for the tournament, he didn't practice uh, Orange's lineup. So he just presumed that uh, Tom's going to win against uh, as Orange. So and uh, they practice against each other. So it's all good. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, the last question I want to ask is uh, you said that you were looking forward to coming to Amsterdam. How have you been enjoying uh, not only the crowd, but also the local city? So, uh, the first two days when we arrived here, so we uh, did some uh, sightseeing, but uh, Simon Sao was still under age, so she, uh, he can go to the, the, the casinos. <laughs> yeah, I picked a bad year for Simon Sao to qualify because he's underage, but uh, Tom being the responsible adult, and he's going to the semifinals, please give a round of applause for Tom60229.